Leiden. Hello, my name is Michael Holmes. I'm a freelance journalist from Potsdam, Germany. I'm today I'm talking to Trita Parsi. Mr. Parsi, you are the vice president of the Quincy Institute. Uh, this is a think tank in Washington, D.C., which is uh, dedicated to a policy of restraint, diplomacy and peace. Uh, you are the author of several books on Iran and Israel. I think three of them, and we'll put a link to your latest one. You have published in the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, BBC, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, and many others. So over the weekend, uh, Mr. Parsi, Iran fired 300 drones and missiles at Israel. Most of them were intercepted, causing little damage, as far as we know. Uh, Western leaders have expressed their outrage and assured Israel of their solidarity. That goes for the United States, Germany, Britain, France, and most of the Western leaders. Uh, please tell us what you think is most important to understand about this dangerous escalation, and what are your thoughts on the Western response? Thank you so much for having me. I think the most important points here is first of all, we should not be in this situation to begin with. If the Biden administration had worked to de-escalate the war in Gaza, uh, pushed for a ceasefire instead of undermining efforts to uh, bring about a ceasefire, we would not see this escalation between Iran and Israel. These are all spillover effects from that war. And if that war had ended and, and put to an end earlier on, we would not be here. I think it's quite clear that the Iranians responded in such a way deliberately to not cause any damage, but rather to show their capability, uh, restore what they believe is their deterrence, and then make sure that there isn't any further escalation from that. Um, one can look at the you know, absence of uh, damage uh, and perhaps draw the conclusion that the Iranians don't have the capability, but I would remind you that had the Iranians not given 72 hours of a heads up to the United States and Israel, and telegraph clearly what they were going to do, which they did deliberately to make sure that Israel would be prepared. If that had not been done, not only would the Israelis not have had the time to put everything on alert, but also certainly the United States would not have been in a position to be able to participate in that very extensive way of shooting down the drones and missiles. In that scenario, the damage Iran likely would have been able to instill on um, Israel would be very, very substantive. And I think that has caused pause in Israel, their realization that actually they are much more vulnerable and that as a result, there is a bit of a balance of terror between Iran and Israel. In regards to the Western reaction, um, at this point, you know, it, it's fascinating that no one is even using the term rules-based order any longer in context of the Middle East because the double standards are just so clear. Europe has ceased to be the type of independent player that could create space for conflict resolution and diplomacy. It is increasingly acting nothing more than an appendix to the United States. And I think that is very bad and dangerous for the world, but also for Europe in the long run. And also incidentally, not particularly good for the United States. An independent Europe that could check some of America's bad impulses, for instance, during the Iraq war, uh, was actually ultimately to the help of the United States. That Europe is now gone. Now you're seeing a Europe that essentially is following whatever the United States decides, and the United States decides whatever it decides by being extremely deferential to Israel. Uh, and Israel's uh, slaughter in Gaza, its violations of international law, war crimes, perhaps even genocide, is certainly not uh, the type of foreign policy that should inspire or uh, be emulated by Europe or the United States. Uh, you have co-authored a report on the interventions of Middle Eastern powers since 2010 uh, for the Queen's Institute. It's called No Clean Hands. We'll put a link to it because I highly recommend it. In this report, you identified six regional powers that intervened most often in other countries. I just want to name them here. They are Iran and Israel, Qatar, Turkey, 
the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And in the report, you underline the fact that only one country of these most expansionist countries in the Middle East is not an ally of the West. And that is, of course, Iran. All the other countries that are often aggressive, interventionist, expansionist are allies of the West. So this report, what I really like about it is gives us a very nuanced view, a very complicated view of a dangerous and complex region. So what do you think a wiser foreign policy would look like that would appreciate the fact that there is no simple good versus evil power struggle in the Middle East? So you, you put your finger on it towards the end there, talking about uh, the manner in which in the Washington narrative, uh, Washington and the United States has very much tended to view the world in terms of good guys and bad guys. This has traditionally not been the way or the discourse, the, the uh, concepts that have been dominating the European approach to foreign policy. I grew up in Sweden and at least back then when I grew up there, if you were to talk about foreign policy in terms of good guys and bad guys, people would laugh at you. Now I see that Europe is also starting to emulate this extremely unhelpful approach uh, in, of this oversimplification, this division of the world between good and bad, which is something that fuels conflict rather than helps resolve it. What this report showed is that uh, there is a large number of countries in the region that are interventionist. The Washington narrative, of course, only focuses on, the United, on Iran. But it showed actually that after 2015, Iran no longer ceased to be the most interventionist country in the region. It certainly is one of the most interventionist. But after 2015, its position was actually eclipsed by Turkey and by the UAE. Turkey is, of course, a NATO member, and the UAE, of course, is um, uh, a very strong US ally. So you have a situation in which most of the interventions actually taking place are by countries who are allied with the United States, funded by the United States, and armed by the United States. The report also shows that security vacuums uh, and, and instability in countries is not only caused by interventions, by, but also these uh, insta instable countries tend to also beget interventions, meaning that once a country goes into political chaos, it tends to attract military interventions. A much better way of approaching this is to just have a much more realist approach and, and recognize that the fundamental problem in the Middle East is that it lacks an inclusive security architecture. That security architecture actually makes the Middle East one of the most under-institutionalized regions in the world in terms of security. Instead, what you have of a security architecture is that you have massive Western arms sales to these countries. So Germany, for instance, is one of the biggest providers of weapons, both to Saudi Arabia and to Israel. The United States, of course, and its entire military uh, uh, industrial complex is to a very large extent financed by arm purchases by GCC countries. So you have one of the least secure countries in the region and one of the most armed uh, uh, regions in, in the world. Um, and, and, and if we truly were looking for stability, we would be pushing and helping bring about the security architecture in the region rather than trying to make money off of that insecurity by selling more weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I traveled to Iran, that was about eight years ago, uh, most people I spoke to were quite strongly opposed to the regime. They wanted more democracy, liberalism, women's rights, and so on. And that was the majority of the people I, I talked to. Uh, but the same people, everybody, also expressed anger and disappointment about Western foreign policy towards Iran. Uh, they complained about the sanctions and the constant military threats. They also said that those sanctions and the threats make it harder for the opposition to sort of liberalize the country or do something against the government. They also talked about Western support for Saddam's war of regression in the 1980s. They talked about the coup against the democratically elected and secular government in 1953, supported by the United States and Britain. And they also talked about the British and the Russian occupations of the country in the first half of the 20th century, uh, 
the, we could call it a form of semi-colonialism that led to famines in the world wars and so on. So there are a lot of grievances that they talked about. They had a positive view of the West when it comes to their internal politics, democracy and the culture of liberalism and so on. But they were very critical, everybody I talked to, about the Western foreign policy. And I think this matters because so many in the West, so many politicians um, believe that they would actually do something good if attack the if they attack Iran because they're doing a favor to the people by in the in, you know in their dream like get regime change and then everybody would be happy and you know so um, what do you think would be the reaction of the people of Iran today if there is a big escalation and a military intervention by Israel and or its uh, most important allies the United States. Well, first of all, I think your assessment is quite correct. Uh, the Iranian people are tremendously unhappy with the repression, the human rights violations, the political and social um, oppression that they are faced with. And of course, massive economic corruption and mismanagement. So all of that is true and they want to see change. And what we saw in the last couple of years is that they largely had given up on the idea of reform. So they wanted to overthrow the government as a whole. Now I think we're in a situation is that they've lost hope for reform, but they also lost hope for revolution. Uh, and they are essentially in a scenario that is quite um, unhopeful for them. They don't see any path forward internally. Uh, and there is no real theory of change of what exactly needs to be done in order to bring about a better internal situation. What I think is clear, however, is that any support for military intervention by the West is minimal. Uh, we see it right now. The Iranian people is very unhappy about the escalation between Israel uh, and Iran. They do not want to see a war. Uh, they have no interest in getting uh, dragged into it. And this is incidentally also part of the reason why the Iranian government actually has been quite restrained in terms of absorbing a lot of blows from uh, Israel, who has killed a large number of Iranian generals and military commanders over the course of the years. And also Iran not actually getting really directly involved in the fighting um, uh, in Gaza, uh, and even putting pressure on the Iraqi militias that Iran supports to seize attacks against U.S. troops. This is all partly because the Iranians are playing the long game, but also because they know very well the Iranian population has zero appetite for a war in the region right now. But if Israel were to attack, or if the West were to attack, I think you would have a significant portion of the population that would rally around the flag. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a very significant. But I think you may also see a similar phenomenon in Iran as you have seen in Israel. When Israel was attacked by Hamas, you had a rally around the flag phenomenon, but not a rally around the leader phenomenon, in the sense that Netanyahu has not benefited politically from this attack at all. The country has come together um, uh, unified against the, the threat from Hamas, but not in a sense of actually rallying behind Netanyahu. He's more unpopular, more embattled now than he was before October 7th. I suspect a similar phenomenon, perhaps not with the same intensity, may happen in Iran. The population will rally around the flag, unite against an external threat, but not necessarily do it in such a way that translates into greater support for a regime that is still and will continue to be very unpopular. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very worried that you would also see a rally around the flag effect in, in the West, meaning that the support for Israel would only grow once uh, an escalation, you know, escalates even more. And once there are more serious attacks by Iran on Israel in a tit for tat retaliation. And I can say for Germany, uh, my feeling is Germany would stand, absolutely stand with Israel if there are more attacks like that from Iran. And they don't ha we won't have any conversation in the mainstream leading media or among the, the 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 most powerful politicians in Germany whether like who started it and whatever it won't matter it's just we have to stand with Israel because they're fighting this evil expansionist regime and who is which is bent on destroying Israel as they as they see it so um, that's why I believe there is a very serious danger of um, fallout war. Absolutely. Now, I think you're quite about right that? about that. And it's also very different from what Europe used to be in the sense that Germany, for instance, was the lead mediators between Hezbollah and Israel. 
and help mediate several of the different conflicts between Hezbollah and Israel. Germany right now has about zero credibility in the region and would never be able to play the role of a mediator any longer. In fact, almost no European country with a you know, non-EU state such as Switzerland perhaps could do so. And this is ultimately really, really bad for Europe as a whole, even if it doesn't lead to a major war, because a lot of Europe's soft power and, and diplomatic weight has been essentially killed by Europe's own politicization of its foreign policy. Um, and if you were, if we were to end up in a military confrontation, I think you're quite right. The political leadership would um, take a very one-sided approach and probably drag Europe into the conflict. I'm not so certain, however, that in the long run, they will manage to convince the European public that this is the right approach. Certainly with the matter in which media in, in Europe right now is, I would say, quite one-sided, uh, they may have some short-term success. But once Europe starts seeing the consequences of the war, and those consequences will be very, very grim, I have a very hard time seeing the European populations being able to support such a policy uh, in the medium or the long term. In fact, even when you take a look at how uh, opinion in Europe is shifting on Ukraine, uh, it's already shifted quite considerably. But that is even short of the Europeans getting directly involved into the war. If they had, I think you would have seen a shift much sooner and much starker. I really feel like, and that is something that surprised me, um, in Germany and the US and uh, many other Western countries, the support for Israel during this genocide in, in, in Gaza, or at least like very brutal slaughter and ethnic cleansing, if you want to, you know, you can uh, disagree on whether it's a full genocide, I think it also depends on your definition of that word. Um, I think that really shows a sort of extremism, fanaticism in, in the West of a very peculiar kind by people who consider themselves to be centrists and moderates, and they are not, as we can see, yes, certainly not on this issue. And um, I'm afraid that the same extremism could come out now with a, with a war with Iran, and then you, it could really go completely off the rails and we are deep into a, a, a war that would be the biggest war in the Middle East um, that we ever had for a very long time, for sure, because, you know, like Iran is a much bigger and much stronger uh, country. Am I now, uh, I mean, please tell me I'm, I'm paranoid or <laughs> exaggerating, but is this, do you think there's a real danger for that? I do fear that that is a scenario that is far more dangerous and likely than I would have thought six, seven months ago. Even mm -hmm. though you know the shifts in Europe had already uh, taken place before October 7, obviously they were intensified by October 7. But I do fear that this is a very, um, uh, unfortunately, realistic scenario. And again, goes back to what we talked about earlier on. Europe has in the past helped play uh, a stabilizing role, uh, a role towards establishing peace, trade, and, and stability. That is not what it is even trying to do, by and large. I mean, just take a look at the one-sidedness of European condemnations of uh, Iran's retaliation for what um, uh, retaliation against Israel and uh, the manner in which many European states, particularly France and the UK, refused to condemn the Israeli attack that precipitated the whole thing by attacking an embassy or a consular section of the embassy. Under normal circumstances, European commitment to the principles of international law would be very steadfast. And I'm not saying that there weren't double standards in the past, but it was nevertheless such that it would be very costly uh, for the Europeans to uh, undermine international law, not to abide by it, not try to uphold it. Now it's as if uh, you know Europeans uh, or most of the European states have no regard whatsoever for international law. Ultimately, it is impossible, in my view, to see how such an approach actually brings about greater security for Europe itself. Traditionally, uh, support for international law had been the bedrock of European security. That seems to have been abandoned. Now, instead, the belief is that the, it's the American security umbrella, nuclear umbrella, membership of NATO, that is the bedrock of security. Um, I personally don't think that that is true. I think we are unlearning the lessons of Europe's history in the 20th century. 
and going back to a much more primitive approach to foreign policy that will bring about far less uh, security and prosperity for Europe and for the world as a whole. Yeah, and I think uh, another factor that is underappreciated here, which makes it even more dangerous, is that much of the region is involved indirectly. Uh, certainly Lebanon, there could be war in Lebanon related to a war with Iran because of Hezbollah. There could be a war in Yemen could escalate. There is already war in Yemen. There's also, also already war in, in Lebanon. And then in Syria, where there's also already war. So uh, we're not only talking about Iran. And if this escalates, the question is if Iranian allies and proxies in these countries and also in Iraq would also escalate and then you know all hell can bro break loose over the, the the whole the whole region like wh where do you think that they're the most dangerous um hot spots here and uh what 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 should be co most concerned here uh I, I think you're quite right uh if there is a broader war you will see the activation of many of these different militias and it will pretty much be all out this is going to have a, a tremendously negative impact for Europe's security, uh, and of course, more immediately, Europe's economy. You're going to see oil prices shoot through the roof. Um, this is going to impact Europe very negatively, mindful of its dependence on oil and gas uh, and its own absence of great, uh, at least oil resources in, in Europe itself. Moreover, that inflation, that economic downturn is also going to impact Europe's ability to sustain its position on Ukraine. So the negative repercussions that will come even short of Europe itself getting directly dragged into the war uh, are already immense. And this is part of the reason why it is so reckless of the Europeans at this point to not pursue security in a more holistic and efficient manner, but rather almost deliberately make themselves part of the conflict rather than part of the solution to the conflict. With that, Michael, I do have to run because my next meeting is starting in just a couple of minutes. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much for talking to us. It was a pleasure. And um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. All the best to you and to Iran also. <laughs> Thank you so much. Best of luck. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.